Better System Trader, episode 56. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hello and welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. This is episode 56 and I'm your host, Andrew Swanscott. Whether you're a retail trader with a small account or a fund manager with millions or billions under management, something that we all need to consider carefully as traders is how or where we're going to use the money in our trading accounts. Capital allocation sounds boring, but it can have such a huge impact on our trading results. Unfortunately, it can sometimes be overlooked for other aspects of trading like entries and exits, leaving traders with an inefficient use of their capital and um, it can result in lower returns and poor performance. Can we use our trading capital more efficiently to achieve higher returns? And if we can, then how? Today's guest, Michael Melisinos, started out as a junior analyst at Bear Stearns and is now running his own systematic trend-following fund called Melisinos Trading. Mike is a competitive guy, always looking for ways to improve his trading performance, and in today's episode he's going to share with us some practical ideas and research, including the three most important things that influence trading performance, why what you trade is more important than entries and exits, Ideas to improve trading results through dynamic capital allocation. How to use indicator scores to measure trend strength and much more. But before we start the chat with Mike, a quick message from our sponsor, MarketSystemAnalyzer.com. Market System Analyzer is a software product designed to help maximize the performance of your trading strategies. It can be used to analyze and provide detailed performance statistics, find the optimal position sizing to reach your trading goals, detect over-optimized trading systems and prevent curve feeding, assess the sensitivity of trading results to trading order, and it also contains features such as Monte Carlo analysis and equity curve trading. So it's got loads of great functionality for traders and at marketsystemanalyzer.com you can download a free fully functional 30-day demo. So head over to the website marketsystemanalyzer.com to check it out. And now onto the chat with Mike. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us today. It's really great to have you on the podcast. Uh, Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Cool. So can we just start with a little bit of background on yourself and um, how you got started in trading? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Um, Well, you know, the real journey probably started when I was a little kid, you know, my obsession with with competition and winning, Um, you know... uh, the seeds were planted back when I was young watching, you know, Super Bowl highlights of, you know, Jerry Rice and, uh, and Joe Montana dominating uh, other teams in Super Bowls. And then I grew up, you know, I came into my formidable years in the uh, in the mid 90s. So, you know, I live in the New York area, so I was a big Yankee fan and, uh, you know, watch them dominate. So I got this I got this uh this itch of, of winning in my blood from a very young age. And, um, you know, I was an athlete my whole life. So, um, you know, I, I brought it into the, into my sports as well to, you know, I brought that attitude into the sports. So, um, you know, after, after my career was over, um, I went into, uh, first into public accounting, which was, yeah, I sold out, you know, I listened to my dad and my uncle way too much. And I said, all right, I'll do that. You know, that sounds okay. And, um, I hated it, uh, and uh, I couldn't. I couldn't shake the feeling of wanting to compete. Still, at something. So obviously, accounting wasn't it. Um, <laughs> so I, I asked my friend who I grew up with, um, uh, who worked at Bear Stearns. I said, "Dude, get me a job. Get me in there. Do whatever you got to do. I'll come in. I'll I'll sweep the floor. You know, all that that whole. You know, I'll do anything it takes type pitch. And um, you know." couple rounds of interviews and i got it and um you know i started there in october 07 so um you know six months later you know the firm was gone so i uh that that was a good that that was my first uh first bad trade uh of my life 
And uh, I learned from that. Um, and then I learned, you know, several months later, um, working, you know, the team I was on at Bear, we went to work uh, at J.P. Morgan, just basically did the same job, just with J.P. Morgan's name on the wall. So uh, during that crisis, that was my, like, second aha moment where it's like, you know what, there, there, there's something better, that, you know. And, and, and during that time, I, I, was, I was researching into trend following, learning. I don't know how I came across it, but I read a couple of books, started reading some blogs, started looking up the traders, reading what they had to say. It's like, you know, this makes sense to me. You know, this is just like, why doesn't anyone know about this? And then, you know, putting that, this knowledge that I felt like I didn't know anyone, anyone else around me uh, who had it, you know, that no one else heard of trend following before. And, um, and I feel like I got, I'm learning about this and I'm living through the crisis and this, in this turmoil. And, um, and I'm like scratching my head, like what, what guys, th- this, this thing could help. You know, what, am, is it me? Am I dumb? Am I not getting something? <laughs> and, you know, I was 23, 24 years old at the time. So, you know, maybe I was dumb. I wasn't confident in, in my knowledge about this stuff because I was fairly new to it, too. So, um, but after after the financial crisis, and at that point, I was looking up and following um, many of the old, you know, pro traders that are still around today, you know, tracking their monthly performance. And the, you know the light bulbs just started going off, and um, and I at that point after you know the Lehman collapse and all that, I said, all right, I got to start something because this this is not going to happen to me uh, down the line. This is not going to happen to me, my family, my friends, whoever wants to whoever wants to come along the ride with me. Um, I'm going to protect against this and put ourselves in a position to to make a lot of money when uh, this stuff happens, you know, mm. this stuff, meaning the crisis type moments and, and uh, you know, the big volatility swings. So, uh, you know, I wimped out for, you know, a couple of years, even after that, even after I knew I wanted to do it, you know, cause I had, I still had to create a system and, you know, do more research and stuff. And, um, and then in January, uh, 2011, I, uh, pulled the trigger and, um, and, uh, here we are five, almost six years later now. Yeah. So, can you explain what you mean by pull the trigger there? Uh started a fund. You know, I well, at first, you know, I did all the research to all right. How do I become a trend following trader? Because that 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 was the the style that resonated with me. That yeah. I felt like I could I can really sink my teeth into, and uh, I can follow this um, like a marine. And um, so, I did all the research into how to become one. You know, the registrations, writing up all the documents taking the series three tests and registering, you know, the, uh, LLC and all this other stuff with the state and all these things. So figured all that out, um, which wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I just started trading, um, three accounts my, uh, my first year. I didn't, I didn't start a fund the first year because the cost was too, a little too much. So I wanted to get like a track record before, I can uh, I can I can bring to other people because with the you know with the single accounts I um, had to keep the minimums pretty high so I couldn't get I couldn't scrape together you know five ten thousand from a lot of different friends and then pool it at that point because I don't want to take on the cost but so I just traded three accounts kept the cost low built a year track record and then the second year I launched the fund vehicle um, once I once I made people more believers of it that I that I could do it. Uh, I could do it well, and that, and they had more reps to understand it. Um, yeah, I still run that same fund today. Yeah, just just with more people. And so you, um, this was a few years ago, and you were quite young for that, um, starting to manage funds. So I expect yeah. perhaps that was a roadblock. What other kind of roadblocks did you face when you were trying to get started there? Oh, so I started when I was twenty six, and <laughs> <laughs> and we had, you know. As I still do now, you know, which broker are we going to trade through? So I started trading at the cheapest and biggest one I could. Um, not every broker, when you're first starting out with little money under management, is going to take you on because they, they have minimum uh, commission requirements, all these things. So so we went to Lind Waldock. Anyone who knows uh, the space, uh, they were bought by who? MF Global. Oh, God. And, and then... 
in October, uh, obviously that the whole thing went down with with, uh, with him at Global. So a lot of our funds were tied up, and here I am, this new twenty six year old, maybe I was twenty seven at that time, um, pitching and 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 managing money for these new people that have I've never managed money before that time. And then here we go. We're in a broker that that's a like a fraud, or you know they they dipped into customer funds, and now and now we can't get the money. So this this was not a good start, you know. Performance is still positive at that point, great, but most of the money was tied up. It was like I don't know if we're gonna get this back, you know. I called I called the woman who uh, I dealt with over there. She says, Mike, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's like you're what? Like I'm trying I'm trying to get started, man. Like you know. Jesus Christ, like, what are the odds of this happening? So I had the bear thing. I had uh, really poor markets, um, you know, since 2011. Um, but in the first, like, six months or so, they were pretty decent. And then I had, and then I had this uh, MF Global nonsense. So, you know, we, obviously we got all the money back, which is great. But it was like a, a blow to, does this kid know what he's doing? You know, <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> and, uh you know, so we weathered all that. We, you know, we, 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 uh, we, we battled through none of my investors at that time left me, uh, which is, which is great. Mm-hmm. And, um, I don't know what other, I mean, other roadblocks, I guess, I guess are really just, you know, yourself, like, you know, myself, you know, I remember in the first several months checking the markets every minute, you know, I was, I wanted to get off to a, such a good start so fast that, I, you know, was working myself up to like a, into a frenzy, you know, and I, and I knew, and I still know that, you know, no matter what I see minute to minute, I'm going to follow my style. So, it, so why look at it all the time if you're not going to do anything? It's just, mm-hmm. you know, it, it just doesn't, do, it doesn't, it's not healthy and it, and it's not really useful if you're not going to use it to trade, you know, uh, that, if that's not your style, then you don't have to watch. Yeah. Um, it's likely some other thing that you're, you know, you're, you're worried about or whatever. So yeah, I was worried about getting off to a good start and, uh, you know, I didn't do anything that, that sab- I didn't sabotage myself from my trading or anything, but I remember, you know, using that energy on the wrong things in the beginning. You know, I should have been, mm. uh, thinking more about, you know, how to improve faster than I did. You know, I, I eventually got to that point where it's like, okay. Um, you know, at that point I, in the first year I was trading 11 markets. Now I trade over 40, but that first year, you know, I just couldn't trade everything. Didn't have enough money. So, um, I remember at that point, it's like, you know, this is dumb because uh, I'm only trading these markets because, you know, some of these markets have the minis and I can't trade some of the markets that don't have mini or micro contracts. So this is like putting me into a corner where, I'm not able to capitalize on, on all the trends. I, I'm 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 selecting. Well, I have a bias because I'm only trading the ones that I can right now. Now, what if the ones off my radar are trending, and and the ones that I am trading aren't trending? You know, my performance is going to suffer. So that started to annoy me to the point where that really pushed me to do the fund faster. Probably, um, it's like you know what, guys, like. You see, this is this isn't going to happen to us. We're a trend following fund. We're supposed to capitalize on trends, no matter where they are, and we're stuck here in with this small portfolio that is not taking advantage of everything. I remember that first year we missed silver, nat gas, and I believe the downtrend in uh, cotton because cotton in late 2010, early 2011 was soaring to the moon, and uh, you know we weren't in that, and uh, we weren't in the downtrend either. So it's like you know. God, you know, that's, that's a perfectly good opportunity that I'm just not in. So, you know, those growing pains of, of learning how to trade better, that's all, you know, how to improve, how to, you know, the skill, the skill of, of trading. Um, so I learned that as, uh, as I've gone and, um, had some of those annoying missed opportunities to propel my, uh, my effort into, uh, into improving. Yeah, cool. So that's interesting. You raised some great points about some of the things you learned from uh, what you were doing starting out. But what about now that you've been running that fund for a number of years? Have, have you mm. had any new insights um, that you've discovered doing that? Yeah, and I feel like it, um, you know, before I started, I called 
uh, like a handful of traders. Uh, David Drews in Hawaii. Um, uh, this guy Mark Sleeman in uh, New Zealand, uh, in your neck of the woods. Um, and a couple other guys. But one thing David Drews um, told me, and a uh, very nice man, very, very um, happy to talk to me. And um, he said, look, the three most important things that influence performance are what you trade, your risk management, and then very far down the list is when you get in and when you get out. So I, I realized that. I said, yeah, you know, that makes sense. Um, and, I, and I learned that, you know, in real time that first year especially because my performance was influenced by the trades I was not in. You know, I wasn't in some of those good trends. So, huh, you know, uh, that that stuck with me and it still does to where, okay, I'm building, expanding the portfolio and I still have more to go. There's obviously I could trade more markets. I could trade double. Um, but I but I really started to research into, OK, looking into different sectors like like uh, highly correlated sectors like like bonds um, and stocks right especially and sometimes you get like energies that are very correlated and metal you know like so, some of these sectors you know you, you trade you trade five markets but they're really the doing they're really the same thing they're doing they're doing one thing so I started to uh, think about that and and think well all right you know I maybe need to add in some extra maybe filters so I don't I don't trade all these markets um, the same way maybe I need to run some correlation studies overlay them as a part of my filters as far as what to take trades in and what not to um, you know I feel like the what a lot of people do uh, and what I think a lot of my competitors have done a lot of the guys that have even started from, Plain old trend following. What they've started to do is to uh, diversify. What Drew's told me, and what I've found to be true in my own research, is 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 diversify their entries and exits, which which does help. You know, I research does, but it it doesn't improve it as much as focusing on your portfolio allocation. You know, how much you allocate to certain markets over another. Not trying to perfect and blend strategies that get in and out at all different times, um, you know, becoming like a multi-strategy firm, basically. You're, you're basically gone away from trend following, you know, you're this multi-strategy thing. Which, you know, you, you could go down that route um, and, you know, Im and improve a bit. But I believe, and what I've seen to notice so far doing my research, is that there's more, there's more um, ability... Uh, to improve it by focusing on your your portfolio allocation and and your position sizing. Um, think about right now, like if you're looking at all this, all the futures markets, all the futures uh, stocks in the um, in the world. What what are the some of the strongest indexes right now? You know, that some are stronger than others, even though they may be trending. If you're overlaying, they may be they may meet your definition of trending if you're overlaying a classic, you know, channel breakout uh, indicator or a, or a moving average um, indicators, you know, they'll all be trending one way or another, but some are trending stronger than others. And you need, yeah. I believe it makes more sense to figure out, you know, come up with definitions, you know, indicators, or whatever, uh, to determine what is stronger and what is not. Um, so I've started to do a lot of work there and started to um, try to improve things that way. You know, I, I believe that that's more important than, oh, we're going to trade one system that's, uh, you know, it buys the 50-day high. We have another one that buys the 100-day, uh, the 150, and the 200. And we're going to blend them all. And we're going to get all the, you know, the entries and exits on different time frames. It's going to blend. It's going to make a better system. Yeah, fine. That, that, you know, that, that's good. Fine. Uh, you could do that, but I think the other the other way uh, what I've seen to be noticing so far is, is focusing on you know what how much risk you're allocating to certain markets, even though they may be correlated um, over over others, um, rather than all this indicator nonsense, all this all this sorry timing, uh, entry and exit 
indicator uh, nonsense. That's what everyone wants to focus on. And uh, it seems to make the least amount of, uh, of improvement. Yeah, I think uh, in in trading, not just in trend following, but also other approaches, there is a, a lot of copying going on, and um, you know everyone, or, or maybe not everyone, but lots of people are looking at the same type of things when they're trading. And uh, so, where do you think? I mean, you've touched a little bit on portfolio allocation and position sizing, but where do you think is the the most potential for innovation in in the trend following space? All right. Well, I, this is what I notice. Um, you know, so back, you know. When the guys first started out, the guys who basically created this industry, um, w- they, you know, at that time didn't have as many markets to trade as they do today, right? Mm. So now, you know, over the years, they've added more markets as they've come on and become more uh, and become uh, you know, more liquid, you know, like the euro and like all these extra, all these other futures markets that came on, they, they, they add them to their portfolio one by one and it seems to improve things, right? But now let's say you get to max capacity and you're like, oh, we can't, you know, there's no more markets to add, you know, we're, we're kind of done. So, you know, what, what happens though is if you do that and you trade all these markets the same as far, meaning you're, you're allocating the same risk. To each market, you know what, what's going to happen. You, you're you're going to naturally overload in currencies, stocks, and bonds by far. There's far more many of financial markets than there are commodity markets. So, you know what happens uh, when stocks, you know, for the past year or two, whatever they've done, uh, excluding this recent breakout to new highs. You know, what happens when, when, when they go sideways for an extended period of time? And you're sitting there with a portfolio of 30 stock markets and you're like, oh, well, we, you know, we stay with our allocation, you know, and we just trade them because, you know, we need to have them in. Well, well, why? You know, why? Hmm. You, you, they're, they're likely doing that because they're either, either too big or they're not thinking anymore. They're just lazy, right? And they got to put capital somewhere, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the reason you, have to, you probably have to ask, but I, I believe it's like, well, you know, if we do that, we'll naturally dilute our exposure to livestock. You know, there's only three livestock markets, right? And there's, you know, 50 bond markets. So if I gave them all the same risk, I, I'm, it doesn't really matter what the livestock markets do. It's pro- they're probably not going to make enough to offset any losses that occur in bonds. So, that becomes dumb, you know. It becomes like, well, all right. Or so, how do we think about this? How do we, how do we, you know, maybe start them with the same risk, but then determine, you know, how do we monitor trend strength and correlation uh, uh, characteristics and and volatility change, um, things like that, to where, hey, man, these these livestock markets or maybe these softs, you know, cocoa, cotton, sugar, whatever. You know, they're trending better, um, but here we are allocating the same amount of capital that we would to bonds and stocks and currencies, and these bonds, stocks, and currencies aren't really doing much. So it's offsetting. It's offsetting our big gains in these mar- in these sectors that don't have as many markets. Um, that seems dumb to me. Like, intuitively, it's like, well, that, that, hmm, weird. You know, why, why... Um, you know, bastardize ourselves or incarcerate ourselves by um, by the amount of just markets that are available. You know, like sometimes, you know, half, you know, uh, a handful of markets or, or even less provide all of the gains uh, for long periods of time. You know, mm-hmm. like what are the strong the strongest markets right now in terms of uh, you know. Uh, several different indicators that I would look at, um, but like let's take a per, uh, let's take a ATR move for the past six months. So you're like what what's like the twenty day ATR six months ago? What's the price move over over that time period the past six months? Um, and how as a percent uh, as a you know normalize it as a percentage of ATR has it moved? You know the strongest markets in the world are lumber, orange juice, sugar soybean meal, c- 
cotton, the Brazilian real, a ruble, uh, palladium, platinum, you know, like it's not the 30 year treasury. It's not the S and P it's not the dollar. It's not mm-hmm. all these markets and all these themes that everyone focuses on all the time. Sometimes it happens in these weird things. So, you know, not many people trade them, but they provide perfectly good trends. So as a small manager, I have the ability to, you know, allocate some risk there and it makes a difference to me. But I feel like, you know, I'm doing my research and like, you know, it, I, I could do this at 10, 20 times my size. So I wonder why other people aren't doing that as well. Um, I see them focusing a lot more, like I would have said before, about all these different trade timing diversification, you know, not not this portfolio allocation adjustments and, and optimization, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like it's a very overlooked area. Um, but uh, I see it provides a lot. Of, uh, it, it, it offers a lot of opportunity there. Um, so uh, that's just some of the things I'm thinking about. Um, could definitely go the route of uh, blending systems and uh, blending tra- uh, trade timing parameters. But, you know, you could do that fine, but that's like kind of an easy one. Like, yeah, we're going to have to do better than this, though. You know, we have to take it a step further than this. Um, yeah. Okay. So, sorry. So, a little bit more on this dynamic allocation idea that um, it sounds like you're suggesting a, an, an allocation strategy that sits over the top of your strategies and determines which markets you should uh, be focusing on. Yeah. Now, you've given us one idea of um, how to measure the, the strength of a trend. I think you said uh, the percentage move over the uh, volatility or the ATR. Do you have any other ideas for um, things that people could possibly look at or investigate for their own trading applications? Sure. Um, well, like, let's say, let's say you want to stick to, um, you know, keep it simple. Let's say you measure, uh, you can use, uh, like, uh, price channels. All right. So let's say you're looking at a market, right? You're looking at, uh, S and P, right? Uh, keep it easy. And you, you have a hundred different price channel, uh, indicators, right? Take it from 20 to, I don't know, 250. And step it, you know, five, ten days at a time or something like that. Um, each, take each um, indicator, uh, you know, a, an uptrend is a plus one, a uh, downtrend is minus one, and then you'll get a score, right? If all of the, or if a lot of the indicators are in agreement, you'll have a high positive score if it's an uptrend and a high negative score if it's a downtrend. Yeah. If you have... Well, some some uh, time frames are up, some time frames are down, and uh, you get a score near zero or within with you know close to zero, within you know plus or minus ten or something. I don't know. Um, then it may not be as strong, right? You may not have as much momentum behind it. Um, that could be something that that overlays on you know it, it it gives you a better idea of what of of how strong it's trending. And maybe you have, you know, oh, when it's when it's a plus, uh, when it's over a plus twenty, a plus thirty, or whatever, I uh, allocate a little more to it. Uh, and and it's you know same thing when it's when it's in the negatives too. I'll I'll short it more or something like that because um, that versus you know some of the other stock markets, uh, uh, it may have a higher reading, and I want to be in the strongest trending markets all the time. You know, I I'll. I'll allocate more to the stronger trending ones. I'll still I'll still allocate something to the less trending ones just in case those start to trend stronger uh, more strongly at some point. Okay. But uh, but you know, you can update that every day, you know, take a reading every day and see what what the stronger ones are, you know. I feel that especially for up and coming managers, they're um, you can't just trade them all the same because uh, I mean, you can, but I feel like you're wasting some good bullets in the gun um, by spraying them out too thinly. You know, it, it may make more sense to to try to f- determine a robust way to determine trend strength mm-hmm. um, and uh, and allocate a little more capital there. You know, it it, it can it, it's it's a, maybe a similar similar uh, result as 
pyramiding or something. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, as you pyramid into the stronger trending market that moves, I don't know, every like two ATR or whatever, however you, you, you would pyramid, you, you reject some, some other, uh, other trade that comes, that comes online later that says, Oh, well now get in this one too. It's like, well, no, 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 I'm already in this one. Uh, it moves first. It's been, it's been moving higher, quicker. Uh, we're allocating our risk here. And you know what? Um, the S and P, uh, let's say like the Dow came later or something like that. Um, you know, they're very highly correlated. So it doesn't really matter if we get into the Dow because it's not different. So we're just going to stick with more of the strong one, you know, stuff like that. You know, I, I don't know. It's, those are just like simple ideas. Um, I, I, I've tried and I've talked to, um, talked to, uh, Jerry Parker about, uh, you know, what I, what I said before about measuring the ATR strength over different time periods. And at first I was like, yeah, oh, maybe we should just measure price strength. But doing some research there, you know, you naturally filter out some things that don't move as much, like, like bonds, you know, like bonds aren't going to have like a 40% six month move, like some agricultures would, you know? And, and if you do that, um, you may never trade bonds, <laughs> you know, you may never trade strongly, but they provide some of the best trends out there. So you have to normalize as far as like volatility goes and stuff like that to, to actually achieve more diversification and, um, you know, provide more balance to your portfolio. So, so that was out. That was an idea that was just, all right, that's out. Um, that's not good. Um, as I look, you know, you look through the back test, you're like, why am I never taking a trade in bonds or currencies? <laughs> you know, it, that, so that didn't work. But when I overlaid it as far as using the ATR move, that's obviously you're, you're getting the move relative to itself, uh, which, yep. uh, which works better. Yep. Oh, great. Thanks, Mike, for sharing those ideas. There's some really cool uh, things in there that people can go and test for themselves. Now, I just yep. wanted to uh, jump back a little bit to market selection because I think you said you – did you say you started with 11 markets or – Yep. How did you initially choose those markets? Like what was the the main reasoning behind those? Well, I I traded the ones that I could afford to take positions in. Um, so I had to take – I had to look at all the – markets available in the minis and the micros uh there's you know some currencies uh that have micros and agriculture and some stocks that have minis so you know breaking it down into four sectors you know stocks commodities uh stocks commodities bonds and currencies i basically try to get even even number in each you know i try to go like two or three in each sector mm -hmm. there and then as i as I added markets, I kind of went one by one, like around the dial. Um, but I, I was selective in when I would add them in because I wanted to add them when I was getting a trend, a strong trend signal. I didn't want to just add them just to add them. Yeah. Um, but, but initially in the beginning, you know, there's really no, like if I had more money, I could be more selective. Um, but in the beginning, I really couldn't choose. I didn't, I, I, I couldn't afford to be picky. I had to choose, I had to trade the ones that, um, that were available for me to even take a position in because I didn't have as much money. Um, so I feel like today, and I, I talk to my investors a lot about this. Um, diversification is a topic that, you know, it's kind of boring, but, but I feel that diversification to me is more, what you're selecting from not it's not a fixed portfolio so i wouldn't i don't want to think of oh I'm, i have a diversified portfolio of uh you know 40 different markets now all right great what, what does that mean you know does that mean you're always in them or does that mean you select the best markets from them and then trade that basket you know so like you know i feel like today diversification to a lot of people, especially to, you know, trend followers that, oh, we have this portfolio of markets that we watch and uh, we always have a position in it, uh, in each one all the time. All right, great. But, but how much, you know, uh, that, you know, that, that, that's more important. So having a portfolio of just a, 
a fixed basket uh, to me is not an optimal thing to do. Um, you know, like like a like a baseball lineup or or a sports lineup. You know, sure you have your starters, right? Because they're better, right? They perform better. But you have your bench players too, just in case one of them starts to suck or one gets hurt or whatever. So you can always play the top line. That's what I feel um, is a better thing to do in um, in our business. You know, I feel like today it's like, oh, we just, you know, we just trade more markets. And then, uh, you know, we give them all the same shot, you know, fair game. Well, why? Some are clearly better than others. doesn't make any sense, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like that's where a lot of the copying has come from. Um, where uh, like the turtle thing or, um, or, you know, other literature that's written on trend following. So oh, get it, give every, give every trade 1% and then whatever happens, happens and exit it when it, when it tells you to exit. Um, well, okay. But I, I want to be, I want to be more allocated to, to stronger markets. H- how do we do that? How do we figure that out? Let's figure that out. Um, and the universe you're, you're picking from, that's what diversification means to me. It's not, oh, I'm diversified. I just have some fixed the portfolio of all these different markets. That, that's not diversified to me. It's, it's better than concentrating in like a stock portfolio. Like, oh, I have all these different stocks. Oh, well, you blend in commodities and currencies and, and bonds. Sure, it'll be, it'll be more diversified because all these different markets do different things. But um, I feel like, well, why do we? Why do you want to trade everything all the time? You know, some are, even though they may be correlated, you know, with like intersector, uh, intersector cor- uh, vol- uh, correlation is high. You know, why do you have, why do you have as big of an allocation to the, the to the weakest trending one in the sector? Like that's dumb. Is it dumb? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but I feel like a lot of people are doing that today, um, and they're they're watering down their performance. But I feel like this diversification sell and this uh, balanced sell marketing pitch is a, oh no, you know we're we're in everything and it, it provides less concentration. Well, sometimes you want to be more concentrated, don't you? Like <laughs> sometimes concentration helps. You know, everyone hates correlation and. And all this, but you know, hey, when correlation's high and things are trending, that's good. You know, especially for trend followers. You know, like you 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 want you want a lot of things to trend at once. Uh, if, if you're taking that spread out approach, but if you're if you're a tactical, you know, like more concentrated guy, uh, you know, within reason, um, you don't have to rely on so many markets to provide all of the performance all the time, you know, um, to be a little bit more tactical with, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to select, we're going to always select the top trending markets from a, from a basket of, from, from a universe of a hundred markets we trade. We're going to trade the top 30 at all times, you know, hmm. the other 70, we're not going to touch them, you know, or, or, you know, stuff like that. That's, I, I don't, I don't see a lot of people doing that because they, they're selling themselves as always. Oh, we're always diversified. Well, that comes with a price. I, I, th- I think. Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying that those type of approaches are more of a scatter gun approach, but you're you prefer to be like a sniper and pick um, you know the markets that are that are best. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like if you do that, you have to overlay these. You know, you have to use more indicators to determine trend strength, and you have to pay attention to correlation. Uh, you have to pay attention to volatility. Th- things. You have to overlay different things that are not historically a part of the uh, trend following uh, literature. It's all about you know just add just add more markets and trade in the same or or blend your entries and exits. Okay, you know, all right, all right, we got we got that, but we we gotta we gotta move forward now. We gotta try some new things, you know. And what I'm talking about today, you know, I'm not recommending anyone do it. I'm just trying to, um, you know, provide some new conversations on how we can get more creative and how we can improve this. Um, 
because we don't really have more markets to trade. We're kind of out of them. They're, they're not coming on. New markets aren't coming online, you know, every month, every year. It's like, you know, we're kind of tapped out. We're like at the max now. Um, so we need to figure out ways to navigate this this universe, this fairly fixed universe we have now in in better ways. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, cool. So a little bit on that trade, the market's the same um, statement you made. So uh, obviously different markets have different um, characteristics or personalities, you could say. Do you yeah. adjust your strategy based on that type of behavior or do you use exactly the same strategy everywhere? I use the same indicators and strategy for every market. Um, so obviously some work it works better on some than others, but, uh, but if you're looking at like a back test, right. And you're like, Oh, well, Oh, you know, this trend following strategy works, works much better on bonds and, uh, and stocks than it does on, uh, uh, some of these softs markets and these, uh, agriculture markets. Huh? We should, uh, we should leave, we should leave this style the same on the ones that it works well, and then we'll change and do another one for these other ones. Let's see what works well on these other one, this uh, these ags and these softs and whatever else doesn't really work. Yeah, uh, that's that to me, you know. So you're making your decision based on what fifty, hundred year, or whatever hundred years of of data. Like, what's to say that we don't go into a period of um, financial calmness uh, where where interest rates don't move much because we have all the central bank intervention and whatever. And we have insane weather patterns. We have insane, uh, plagues and, uh, and crop, you know, uh, deterioration or, you know, weird things that just hasn't happened in the past 50 to hundred years. You know, um, that, that to me, where you're starting to select specified strategies to, that that perform well in the back tests and you're going to take it as far as it as it does going forward uh you, you need to be in like constant re reinventing yourself mode uh and that that to me is dangerous um because you're probably not going to react fast enough um i feel like having a robust style robust strategy to enter and exit markets and how to how to position size them um, should be left the same, uh, at all times because it gets too dangerous as far as, you know, you, you'll likely start to change more and more, you know, like, like in theory, you're like, Oh no, no, I, I won't do that. I'll, I'll leave it the same. But when things start to not work and, and the strategies that did work in the back test, now they don't work. And now you're like, Oh, because you're using your past data to determine what you're going to do in the future. You're always changing, always changing everything. Um, I feel like that's like kind of one of the, one of the prices to pay in, in trading is that you're not going to hit it perfect all the time. You know, yeah. like work on your swing. If you're like, I'm sorry, I make another baseball analogy, but you, 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 you can't change your swing with each pitcher. You know, each, each pitcher is different, but more or less, they throw the same style of pitches, right? So you, you, you can't alter your your timing, your strategy, uh, your swing for each pitch, for each pitcher, blah, 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 blah. You can't constantly reinvent it. You have to like stick to your core thing and maybe make slight changes over time. But there's slight changes that you're going to do as as far as you can, you know, determine at that time. You're gonna do forever. You're not you're not gonna say, oh well, Joe is pitching today. I gotta all right, so I'm going to uh, start with an open stance, and then when uh, when uh, Rick is pitching, I'm going to start with a closed stance, and I'm going to choke up more. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? No, no, no. <laughs> Just stick with the same thing and and adjust um, in the game. You know, you, you don't have to change. You don't have to reinvent your entire swing, you know, pitcher to pitcher. You, you go insane. You'll never hit anybody, you know. I believe you have to keep the same approach for each for each uh, market in this case, um, because you know whether or not be, it, it, you may just not hit that pitcher well, you know, with that style. But that doesn't. That's not to say that you won't hit, start hitting it well in some time in the future. You know, things can change. Um, so I feel like changing all the time. You'll, you'll likely you'll be changing at the wrong times. You know, you'll get the worst of all the worlds. I feel. 
Yeah, that's a great analogy. Thanks for sharing that one, Mike. Now we might uh, just start wrapping up with some quick closing questions. Okay. Um, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Um, this might seem a little sappy, uh, but if you don't have a good uh, woman or, or a partner um, by your side, I feel like you're at a disadvantage. My, I say my biggest advantage is my wife, because when I, I get jacked up about you know drawdowns, losses, you know, and I've I've learned that. Hey man, this is just part of the deal. Like you can back this all you want. You can research, you know, you can't research and test your feelings out of it. Um, yeah. so she has helped me over the years because, um, uh, it's funny. We have like this fist pump indicator, uh, or sorry, fist <laughs> pound where I start losing money and I slam my hand down, uh, on the whatever. And you know, she's, she's like a rock. She's, uh, uh, she keeps me, in perspective of, hey, you know, this is just part of the deal. You know, like, you know this. It's it's nothing new. You've you've done this over the years. Like, when are you going to stop? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know that I will stop. Uh, like, I'm never going to get, I'm never going to get used to losing. I, I n- never, it like, makes my blood boil. I can't, I can't stomach it. But I know it's part of the deal. And I, I feel like if you have a, a life uh, set up around you, that, you know, in the, in the relationships you have around you that allow you to derail yourself and, and you have people around you that don't support you or keep you, you know, that, that, that help you, uh, give you feedback and, uh, you know, keep you calm or whatever, keep you on track. Hmm. Um, I feel like you're, you're, it's only a matter of time before you, for you sabotage yourself. So that, that's one thing I've learned is that, uh, you know, I, I feel like I have a really good, amount of self-discipline and, and um, especially you know, come from sports and take care of my health and all that stuff. But, but she's a major advantage uh, that I have. Um, you know, uh, I think guys in, in the past, they've, uh, you know, maybe more when guys are more discretionary uh, back in the day, they talk about like, Oh, when guys are going through a divorce or something like that, or a death in the family, their performance suffers. You know, obviously you can, you can create a system that, that, if you follow the rules, you, you can help that, I guess, a bit, but you still have to follow the rules. And, mm. you know, it's it's not, oh, because I have a system, I always do it. No, you can easily not do it. But I feel like if you have that support system around you, um, that's that's a huge advantage. Huge. Yeah. That's great. Okay. So um, what about the best trading advice you've ever received? Um. I think I think what I said before from David Drews, um, and if uh, if people don't want to go back, it, uh, it was uh, the most influential parts of performance are um, the markets you trade, the markets you don't, uh, your position sizing and risk management, and then um, how you enter and exit trades. Mm. Uh, but but one thing I wouldn't call it advice, but uh, um, Ed Sakota um, kind of pissed me off one time when i called him and i asked him if he uh if he would invest with me and he said uh <laughs> he said you know how's your performance and uh, i told him he's like well you know i got i'm investing in some things that are doing a little bit better uh so uh i don't want to take it out of that and put it into yours uh <laughs> i was like ah, okay nice to meet you uh <laughs> um but but that really that really set me on the a path of, oh man, I gotta get better type of thing, mm. and and he also call, called me out, um, which you know Ed is Ed is just like such a uh, intuitive, uh, you know, genius where he just sees he just sees you he sees you to your core in like literally like a minute. So he called me out for shyness, you know, too. Which this has nothing re- um, nothing to do with trading really, but. Um, you know, more of like being a business person where, you know, shyness, you know, he could probably hear it through my voice on the phone. Um, you know, if you're a trader, you have to, you know, tell other people about what you're doing, ask for money and stuff like that. It's not easy to do. Um, and same thing too, shyness with taking risks in the markets, um, trying new things, um, be willing to, to challenge yourself and, not just blindly follow and copy what you've heard or read in books or heard, 
you know, other guys on podcasts say, you know, mm. don't be shy, you know, raise your hand. I always had a problem raising my hand in school because I didn't want to look like an idiot. I didn't, you know, a lot of times I knew the answer. And after another person answered it, I was like, God damn, I knew the answer. But why didn't I do it? Why didn't I answer? You know, but there's that, that shyness that, that keeps us from getting noticed and it keeps us from getting better, uh, you know, challenging ourselves. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't really training tactical advice. It was more, you know, bigger picture advice. But uh, definitely can apply it to trading, and I and I have. Yeah, cool. And what about? Uh, yeah. f- sorry, what about favorite trading books? Um, I like all the classics. Um, I like you know, Remnants of a Stock Operator was great. Uh, I, although I believe there's a new Jesse Livermore book that just came out. Um, I don't know who the author is though. I. I Someone had to look had to look into that. Yeah. Um, I I really like the I mean the old Market Wizards book. I mean I could read that like a hundred times and just you just feel like you get to know them um, a little bit. But uh, I like the new one. There's a new one uh, Winton put out. It's not I don't know if it's really like a trading book. It's more like about how the um, they they go. I think they highlight different periods and time, different bubbles and manias and you know, feasts and famines and how it affects markets and all that. Mm-hmm. I think it's uh, it's available on a PDF online if you go to Winton Capital site. Um, I would highly recommend that because they did a really good job illustrating all that. Um, and uh, I really, it's not a book, but I love the old Paul Tudor Jones documentary. Like watching a future billionaire work is you know, sometimes like all the motivation you need, or sometimes like if you can, if you, if you could see it over reading, reading quotes and watching or hearing him talk, yeah. but you could see him uh, in action, just like watching sports guys uh, train or whatever, and see the intensity. Uh, that's I, I love that stuff. I, I wish I wish they we've we've had more of like behind the scenes. Uh, uh, like into the lives of like traders and watching them work and uh, do all that. But traders suck because they you don't want to give away any information because they're afraid everyone's going to like steal it. You know, like, <laughs> come on, you guys are crazy. You know, like look at the chefs out there that are, that are providing cookbooks left and right and doing talk shows and do all these shows. They show everyone what they do. Yeah. No one's starting new restaurants and putting them out of business. You know, we need more, we need more sharing in this community. Um, so I feel like that documentary was great. Um, I'm trying to think of other things, it's probably like you know all the same answers. I, I don't really like the like the tactical trading books where it's all like systems and stuff. Um, I like more of the like biography stuff. Um, that that's what I like more. Yeah, cool. All right, and what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Uh, well, I, I have two two sites. Um, one's like a blog site um and uh working on a book right now too uh but that's just my name it's michael melasinos.com and then i have my firm's uh trading site which is uh melasinos trading.com and uh you know i got a lot of content on on both sites and uh you know i try to be very uh helpful and um you know share with people what i do and how i feel about things so uh if anyone reaches out and has any suggestions and you know what content they'd like to see um, i like to be very open uh without being promotional i don't like to promote any anything because you start promoting things and it's like you can't get it approved by the nfa or cftc they're just nope can't say that nope can't say that so uh (laughs) that's crazy but uh, i'm all over twitter and you know facebook too and people can hit me up on all the social media outlets i'm all over yeah, cool. I'll share the links to those on the show notes page so that's easy to find for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so final question, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we wrap up for today? Um, I'd say what, to what I would say to, to younger people today is like get good at something because the, the industry, all industries now are if, – if you're not a friend of the, of the system uh, – you need to get good. You need to get better um, because um, things are getting cheaper and you're not going to be able to ride the coattails of the fee structures of the good guys before you. 
um, for very long. You know, people are going and they're finding cheaper options, and you need to be better in order to, in order to earn earn your keep, so to speak. So yeah. um, get good and uh, don't be shy like I was, I am, and uh, uh, constantly test and try new things. That's that's all I would say. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot for your time today, Mike. We covered some really uh, great content there. So thanks uh, a lot for sharing your ideas and your experience. And um, I wish you all the best for the future. You got it. Bye. Bye. Okay, so a big thanks to Michael for his time chatting today. If you have any questions or comments on this episode or are looking for more information, head over to the show notes page at bettersystemtrader.com slash 56. Also, make sure to check out our sponsor, marketsystemanalyzer.com for a fully functional 30-day demo of their software. Last week, I sent out an email asking for your help. We're always looking for ways to improve Better System Trader and I want to make sure that we're covering the topics that will benefit the most people, so I sent out an email asking a few simple questions. Now, firstly, a huge thank you to all those people who did provide responses. The insights we're getting from that feedback has been so helpful, but we need more. So please, if you have a few moments spare, please go back to that email I sent you and click on the link to access the questions. Uh, It's very simple. It'll take you literally two minutes, but the information is so valuable for us to be able to shape better system trader in the future. So thanks for all your support. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Mike and I look forward to catching you at the next one. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.